This is Major General John McNeil, who was a native of Nova Scotia. We'll talk at length about him a little later on. And as you can see, my contact information is on the right. You have my website address and my email address. If you do try to contact me or go to the website, please remember that my name has an S on the end. It's Knights. It is a little bit unusual, and many people do drop the S. Here's a tombstone, a headstone from uh, St. Thomas, Ontario. This is a dual headstone for Corporal Octavius Wallace and his father, Patrick. They're both buried here. Octavius was killed at the Battle of Williamsburg on May 5th, 1862, when he was 26 years old. You can see the American flag and the Grand Army of the Republic grave medallion on the right side. Octav Octavius served in the first division with Sarah Emma Edmonds, who was actually the inspiration for my book, Soldier Girl Blue. It was only by chance that I came across this image online, but I couldn't make out the last name and I couldn't find any other details. But a few days later, I randomly opened up a book about Canadians who fought in the war and there it was, including Wallace's name and background. So I think clearly he wanted to be found. And here is Emma, Sarah Emma Edmonds. Her married name was Seely, and she is from Makadavik, New Brunswick. It is pronounced Makadavik. This photo is from about 1885, 20 years after the war. And again, she was the inspiration for my protagonist in my book, Soldier Girl Blue. Edmonds was one of at least 550 women that we know of, both Union and Confederate, who disguised themselves as men in order to fight in the war. Female soldiers who fought as men are referred to as the distaff soldiers. Distaff, which figuratively means having to do with women, derives from the spindle on a spinning wheel. And significantly, she was the only Canadian distaff soldier we know of. She was the only person who was both a woman and a Canadian who fought in the war, as far as we can determine. 32 Canadian and maritime born men were awarded the Medal of Honor. 17 Canadian and Maritimers were, uh, became generals. Most of those were brevetted for meritorious conduct. Now, we talk a lot about uh, people who, were, who received the Medal of Honor during the war. I just wanna make it clear that the Medal of Honor was the only medal for valor during the Civil War and standards were not uh, the same as they are today. They were not as strict. As a matter of fact, in 1916, 911 medals were re revoked as having been awarded inappropriately. However, none of the medals awarded to Canadians were, were revoked. And it's interesting to note that out of all the medals awarded during the war, 40%, uh, not awarded to date rather, 40% were awarded during the Civil War. So how many Canadians actually were here or came here? Well, by 1861, there were a quarter million Canadians and Maritimes living in the U.S. And that is when a popul the population of Canada and the Maritimes was only 3.3 million. Most moved to the northern states. Only a few, 2%, went to the southern states. And a good number of Canadians and Maritimers had relocated when they were children. This is why you'll hear me referring to them as Canadian-born or Maritime-born. As many as 55,000 or even 60,000, some academics think, Canadians and Maritimers enlisted on both sides, most on the side of the Union, and over 7,000 died from combat and disease. Many had lived in the U.S. for years, but again, others crossed the border to fight, and when they did, they were in violation of the British Foreign Enlistment Act as England and Great Britain had declared neutrality. Canadian authorities tended to turn a blind eye, except in cases of deserting British soldiers. Now, due to saber rattling by Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton and others, Canadians feared invasion by the U.S. Great Britain sent 14,000 troops to defend the Canadian-American border, but they soon began deserting to join the Union Army, where they were paid better and were treated better. On a single night in July of 1862, 27 members of the British 13th Regiment disappeared from their Toronto barracks. Extra sentries were eventually posted at the border, not to keep the Americans out, but to keep the British soldiers in. In the end, nothing was able to stem the tide of British Army desertions. Why did they join? Well, they joined really for the same reasons American boys joined. They wanted the money. There was a time of low unemployment. There was a good recruiting bonus. They had good pay. They were stirred by the need for adventure and that martial passion that still uh, stirs many young men. Many were already living in the U.S., again, a quarter million by 1861. Some descended from American loyalists 
who uh, had left the colonies uh, after the American Revolution. Their grandparents were colonial Americans. Many were anti-slavery and abolitionists. As an example of anti-slavery sentiment, there is Colin Shaw of Prince Edward Island. Shaw was a devout Christian who wanted to preserve the Union and free the slaves. While he was posted on a southern plantation, he taught the slaves there to read, which didn't make the plantation's mistress very happy, as it was illegal in Virginia to, um, to teach slaves to read. He was eventually killed at Gettysburg. Many Canadians had family and business ties, mostly with the North. There was social and peer pressure, that's just like there was here. Those who settled in the U.S. tended to join uh, with their neighbors, both North and South, and many were duped or coerced by recruiters or brokers in a scheme called crimping. What is crimping? Well, crimping technically is encouraging or helping someone to enter the military, but as the war progressed, it came to mean tricking or forcing someone to join. Many recruiting brokers for the money became crimpers. As the war progressed, the need for recruits increased dramatically. Recruiting was the responsibility of provost marshals, but by the end of 1863, most had contracted with civilian brokers. Briefly put, these brokers would help men enlist for a share of the recruiting bonus, known as a bounty. In one case, the provost marshal for Utica, New York, signed a three-quarter million contract, which is 13 million today, with a broker to fill the town's recruiting quota. Now, I have found that hard to believe, but I tracked down the, uh, the source for that. Canadian academic John Boyko documented this in his book, Blood and Daring. I confirmed it in a source, New York's Bounty Hunters by Eugene C. Murdoch. So much money and government pressure for more recruits engendered greed, corruption, and desperation. In January of 1863, a group of armed American soldiers led by a Captain Haddock pulled Canadi Canadian Ebenezer Tyler from his bed in Kingston, Ontario. Haddock insisted Tyler was a deserter while Tyler insisted he had never left Canada. Regardless, Tyler was pressed into the U.S. Army. Tyler was somehow able to contact the British ambassador in Washington, Lord Richard Lyons, who was then dealing with a number of similar cases of Canadians having been flagrantly kidnapped and pressed into military service. Soon thereafter, Secretary of State Seward admitted the Tyler case was a violation of the sovereignty of a friendly state. Abraham Lincoln had Haddock dishonorably discharged and Tyler returned to Canada. But not all such cases ended so happily. After the draft was instituted in the northern states, draftees could hire substitutes to serve in their place for $300 or $9,000 today. In April 1864, a broker named A.B. Pratt brought two Canadian boys to a provost marshal in Albany, New York. At the time, Pratt had two draftees in need of substitutes. One of the boys was rejected, but the other was accepted. The provost marshal asked the boy how much he was being paid. When he replied he was promised $150, the provost marshal told him he should be getting the entire $300. At that point, an incensed clerk nearby knocked the broker, Pratt, down several flights of stairs. What was the final outcome? The clerk was convicted of assault, Pratt went back into business, and the boy went into the U.S. Army. The Militia Act of 1862 was intended to increase the size of the Army, of the Union Army, by authorizing African-American soldiers, but the necessary numbers just didn't materialize. Shortfalls and volunteers were made up by conscription. Immigrants who had uh, filed for citizenship could be drafted, but quotas could also be met by volunteer immigrants who had not filed for citizenship. Immigrants who joined or were drafted could replace a citizen needed at home, so they were welcomed. Canadians did become substitutes for draftees, earning $300 or, again, $9,000 today. Some did it more than once in a scheme known as bounty jumping. A man would join a unit, claim his bounty, then desert to join another unit and repeat the scam. While the British government tried to help Canadians who had been crimped, they refused to come to the aid of bounty jumpers who were caught, and at least two Canadian bounty jumpers are known to have been executed by the Union Army. The draft in the North and the South resulted in draft dodgers fleeing to Canada. At the same time, Canadians, Maritimers, and deserting British soldiers were going south to join the Union Army. The border had to be a very busy place then. Canadians and Maritimers enlisted both individually, of course, and in groups. Hundreds came from uh, Ontario to join the Michigan regiments. Nova Scotians, uh, you remember Nova Scotia uh, is Latin for New Scotland. Nova Scotians 
uh, came down to uh, join the Highlander Regiment in Boston as they did join to join other Highlander regiments throughout New England. And French Canadians who had immigrated to Louisiana joined Southern regiments with their neighbors. A typical story, by the way, is Charles Higgins of Font Hill, Ontario, who left his family's farm in the spring of 1862. He went to Buffalo, New York, looking for work. And a letter to his brother, he said, arrived in Buffalo at two o'clock, got a room for $12 a week, which is $300 today. Went around to see the sites, looked for work, found nothing to do, so I enlisted in the 14th U.S. Army. This is an example of a recruiting poster placed in the Canadian working class neighborhoods. This one is by a man named Arthur Rankin, who was a member of parliament and an officer in the Canadian militia. In the summer of 1861, a similar poster advertising railroad, railroad work in Pennsylvania appeared in working class neighborhoods in Toronto. It seemed to be outwardly innocent at the time when so many Canadians were crossing the border looking for work, but everyone understood the posters were really recruiting for Pennsylvania regiments. Newspapers were filled with similar ads. Now, Arthur Rankin himself was an interesting character. Uh, he was a member of parliament and a colonel in the Canadian militia. He was authorized by Abraham Lincoln to raise the first U.S. Lancers. To do that, he recruited 683 Canadians and took them south across the border, but then got himself arrested in Toronto for violating the Foreign Enlistment Act. The 683 men got away with it and were dispersed to other units in Michigan. But this incident brought the recruitment of Canadians and Maritimes into the U.S. regiments out of the shadows. The Governor General of Canada wanted, wanted it to stop, but he was ignored. Rankin, by the way, was acquitted on a technicality. And here is Sarah Emma Edmonds, again of Makadavik, New Brunswick, also known in the war as Frank Thompson. The left is a pre-war photograph of Edmonds in her male attire on the, in the right, again, about 20 years after the war in 1885. Uh, while she was convalescing from, from um, malaria, she wrote her memoir, Nurse and Spy in the Union Army. It was a bestseller, and you can still find it online today. If you go to projectgutenberg.org, you can download it there at no charge. Her male disguise was so effective that she briefly fooled her mother and sisters during a short visit home. Although she served primarily as a field nurse, we know that Edmonds, as Frank Thompson, did shoulder a musket with the infantry at the Battle of Williamsburg. And again, she was the only distaff soldier we know of who was also Canadian, and she was the inspiration for my book. Sarah Emma Edmonds left home at 15 to escape a misogynistic and dominating father who wanted to marry her off to a, an older man. Her mother actually helped her to escape. She eventually found work as a Bible salesman um, so she disguised herself as a man, not only for that, but also because a single woman could not travel safely at that time, and it was just made sense for her to do that. Um, she joined the 2nd Michigan Infantry in Flint, Michigan, after she had immigrated there for a better uh, uh, salesman job. She joined as Frank Thompson. Now, what inspired her to disguise herself as a man and go off on this life of adventure? Her... Her biographer, Sylvia Dannett, believes that she was inspired by a literary genre in the mid-19th century called the female warrior motif, where you would see strong female protagonists portrayed in novels. When Sarah Emma Edmonds was about nine years old, a, an itinerant peddler was allowed to stay overnight in her home, which was very common back then. She, uh, he gave her a book, a novel, the first novel that young Sarah had ever seen, and it was titled Fanny Campbell, the Female Pirate Captain, A Tale of the American Revolution, which, by the way, is still available online at Amazon.com. Uh, but the uh, ironic thing is, though, is that Sarah Emma Edmonds was a British citizen who was inspired by a tale of the American Revolution. She fought a first bull run, then participated in the rest of the Peninsula Campaign under McClellan. She was a field nurse, carrier, postmaster, mail carrier, orderly, and injured at least twice. And she did disguise herself on several occasions to go behind several uh, go behind Confederate lines. As a mail carrier between Union troops near Richmond and the supply depot near White, ha White House Landing, Edmonds crossed the Chickahominy River in Virginia several times, contracting malaria. She also crossed it on one or two of her spying missions. 
The malaria caused her to leave the army and, and eventually killed her in 1898 at the age of 56. Regarding her injuries, during the Battle of Fair Oaks, her horse, Reb, bit her and kicked her. After the battle, General Fel Kearney gave her a Confederate officer's sword in recognition of her conduct as a courier. In return, she took the opportunity to unload her horse on him and she gave him Reb. But she did warn him that the horse was dangerous. Now, Kearney, remember he only had one arm, Kearney didn't believe her until the horse kicked him to the ground several times. While carrying mail by mule during the Peninsula Campaign, she attempted to cross a ditch. The mule stumbled and fell on her leg. Didn't break her, but it did injure her badly. But not uh, As a result, she developed arthritis later in life. Because she never went to the hospital out of fear she would be discovered to be a woman, there were no records of her injuries. Consequently, she eventually received a military pension but since she was unable to prove her injury, she, she could not uh, qualify for a medical disability. The one thing that was sure to uh, expose these distaff soldiers, these women who fought as men, was if they were wounded or injured and went to the hospital. So she had to avoid that. Now, significantly during her military career, she went behind Confederate lines several times as a spy. On her first mission, she entered Yorktown disguised as a black slave boy and later went into Williamsburg, posing as an Irish woman selling cakes. On another occasion, she again dressed as, as a civilian and mingled with the residents of Louisville in an attempt to identify those who were Confederate spies or merely pro-Confederate civilians. Once, when dressed as a, a civilian man, while reconnoitering in Lebanon, Kentucky, a Confederate cavalry unit found her and pressed her into, into the Confederate Army. Soon afterwards, they came upon a Union cavalry unit. While the Confederate captain was distracted, Edmonds claimed she made a dash to the Union soldiers whose commander somehow recognized her. She later wrote that before the Confederate captain could draw his pistol on her, she emptied the contents of her pistol into his face. This story is rather fantastic. It isn't clear how she avoided being shot by either the Confederate troops or Union troops. Edmonds did admit later in life that her memoir consisted of some fabrications and experiences of others. However, her biographer, Sylvia Dannett, Confirmed, as much, confirmed much of her story in her book, She Rode with the Generals, including some of her missions as a spy. Edmonds revised her memoir to reflect her true experiences, but her family lost it shortly after her death. She had a serious malaria attack in 1863 and left the army to avoid detection. She wanted to come back, but was uh, declared a deserter, or Frank Thompson was declared a deserter. She did return later as a field nurse with the Christian Commission. She eventually did receive a uh, pension of $12 a month in 1884, and she did receive back pay. That would be worth $314 today. After the war, she moved to Kansas, then Texas. She's the only woman to be inducted into the Grand Army of the Republic, and she died in 1898 from the malaria she had contracted in the Army. Buried in Laporte, Texas, then reburied in, at uh, Hollywood Cemetery in Houston. After an attack, of malaria in 1863, as I said, and leaving the army to avoid being hospitalized and discovered to be a woman, she escaped to a boarding house in Oberlin, Ohio, where she placed herself under the care of a local doctor. After recovering from malaria, she wanted to return to the army, but found, as I mentioned before, Frank Thompson had been listed as a deserter. She then came to Pittsburgh, where she, list, uh, she had her male persona. We don't know why she went to Pittsburgh or what she did there. She then returned as Emma Edmonds to the same boarding house in Oberlin, where she wrote her memoir while she continued her convalescence from the malaria attack. She eventually returned to the Army as a female nurse in 1864 after joining the Christian Commission. When she wrote her memoir, she wanted to conceal her duplicity, as she called it, from her former Army comrades. So she altered names or used only initials, sometimes the wrong ones, to mislead people and did not admit to being a woman. Now, we have to remember that back in the day, back in the mid 19th century, a woman disguising herself as a man was not only illegal, but it was also a shameful thing to do. So they never really talked about it. And to have someone write their memoir and then later admit it later in life is very unusual. Her memoir, Nurse and Spy in the Union Army, was a bestseller. Profits went to the U.S. Sanitary Commission and charities for wounded soldiers. Disabled soldiers and war widows earned money by selling the book by subscription. By 1884, she was practically debilitated by malaria, which forced Edmonds to finally apply for a pension based on her military service. In doing so, she had to admit at that time to uh, masquerading as a man. 
After a lot of effort on her part, an act of Congress removed the charge of desertion from her record and approved a pension of $12 a month. Back pay, et cetera, was included. And again, she used the money to open and run a small home for invalid soldiers. Her eventual husband, Linus Seeley, was a Canadian from a Virginia Loyalist family. He was also a New Brunswicker. She met him in Harpers Ferry in 1864 when she was a nurse, a civilian nurse. After uh, the war, she attended Oberlin College for a short time. In her memoir, uh, Edmund stated that she was motivi motivated by patriotism for the U.S., her adopted country. She remembered the war as a time for entire self-sacrifice, entire self-forgetfulness, and subordination to preserving the Union. Based on what we know of her personality, she was undoubtedly also seeking adventure, which she certainly found. All right, so we have uh, this individual, uh, Canadian Lou. I came across uh, her in my research. She belonged to an unknown federal unit, and in 1862, she was discovered by local police while drunk in Memphis, and that is all we know about Canadian Lou. It's intriguing to think that she might be another Canadian distaff soldier. I just can't locate any more information about her. Okay, who were the Canadians at Maritime is at first bull run? known as Manassas to the Confederates. Uh, it was, of course, the first battle of the war. We already talked about Sarah Emma Edmonds of New Brunswick. Thomas Roon uh, of Nova Scotia by way of Boston uh, received a musket ball to the head and is most likely the first Canadian casualty of the war. His grave, along with those of five other soldiers, was discovered in 1997. He was identified by a broken jaw that he was known to have. We've already talked about Octavius Wallace, who fought uh, with Edmonds. We don't know that they knew each other, but he was in the same division. Robert Beecham was also with, uh, was with the second Wisconsin. He joined to end slavery. His family had moved to the U.S. Was only, when he was only about five years old. Uh, many Canadians came south to fight in the war. Others had been here for, in, for many, many years, as I had said before. Captain David Brown of Montreal commanded the Company D of the 79th New York, and Captain Edward Doherty of Wickham, Quebec, was also there. We'll talk more about him uh, later on. He's very interesting in his own right. And uh, the brothers Alonzo, Jasper, Alfred, and Newton Wolverton of Wolverton, Ontario, were civilian teamsters with the 50th New York Infantry. And um, they were affected by the, what we call the Trent Affair. Um, I'll back that up. In November 1861, the USS San Jacinto stopped the Royal Maine uh, mail steamer Trent, a British ship, and seized two Confederate diplomats, James Mason and John Slidell. Queen Victoria and Prime Minister Lord Palmerston uh, threatened war over this violation of their sovereignty. They demanded the release of uh, the diplomats and an apology. Lincoln didn't want a two-front war, so he released the diplomats, but he did refuse to apologize. After the Trent affair broke, 15-year-old Newton Wolverton met Lincoln to express his and his brother's concern that they couldn't fight against Great Britain. Now, remember, back then, it was relatively routine for citizens to come into the White House and meet the president. Lincoln told him, quote, we're happy to have you Canadians helping the Northern cause and want you to stay. As long as I am president, there will be no such war. You may be sure of that, end quote. The Trent Affair, however, did help convince Canadians and Maritimes that the American Civil War did involve and it did threaten them. As a side note, three years later, by November 30th, 1864, only Alonzo was left. Jasper died of typhoid in 1861. Newton took Jasper's body home and returned with Alonzo. Alfred died of smallpox in 1864. 1864. Newton Later joined the army and returned to Canada when his enlistment expired in 1863. Alonzo eventually enlisted in the 20th Independent Artillery, Ohio Light Artillery. In October of 1864, Alonzo was captured, but was paroled a few days later. At Franklin, Tennessee, he was part of Major General David Stanley's four corps that had been ordered to delay Lieutenant General John Bell Hood's advance on Nashville. Manning artillery during the fight, Alonzo was grazed by a couple of bullets. Confederates got within 10 feet of the federal cannon. His battery was in the worst position and lost half its men. The Confederates got so close that he and his soldiers could push them back with their ramrods. He wrote to his sister in Canada that he never expected to survive, but he did. 
getting to the Navy, of 118,000 men who joined, over 5,500 were Canadians and Maritimers. Unlike the Army, the Navy Revenue Cutter Service, which later became the U.S. Coast Guard, always accepted black enlistees. Out of an estimated 18,000 black sailors, 348 were from Canada and the Maritimes, and Canadians and Maritimes were the third largest foreign-born group in the U.S. Army after the English and the Irish. Now, how did people of African descent uh, come to be in Canada? Well, slavery was abolished in 1834 in Canada, only 27 years before the Civil War. Late in the 17th century, African slaves arrived in Quebec, and in 1763, the governor of Quebec, James Murray, sent an urgent request to New York for slaves to meet la a labor shortage, and 500 slaves were brought by the Mar to the Maritimes by loyalists flee fleeing the revolution. Now, add to this those slaves who escaped to Canada via the Underground Railroad, many of whom did return to join the U.S. Colored Troops. 825 Black Canadians and Maritimes enlisted in the U.S. Colored Troops. And here we see Anderson Ruffin Abbott, Canada's first Black surgeon. Now, although you see him in uniform here, Abbott served as a civilian contract surgeon after his application for a commission was ignored. He was only one of 13 black surgeons to serve. He was born in Toronto in 1837 to free blacks from Alabama. He served in Washington, D.C. from 1863 to 1865 at the Contraband Hospital, later called the Freedmen's Hospital. Then he worked at a hospital in Arlington, Virginia. He attended Lincoln the night of the assassination and later married Todd Lincoln, presented him with a shawl Lincoln had worn to his first inauguration. Dr. Solomon Secord, pictured here on the right, had immigrated to Georgia some years before the war. We have Francis Wafer on the left, also from Ontario. Secord was an abolitionist. And he was jailed by the Confederates and by some accounts almost lynched for his abolitionist leanings. Regardless, he fought for the Confederacy in the 20th Georgia Cavalry. Secord and Francis Wafer, a surgeon with the 108th New York, were only one mile apart during the Battle of Gettysburg, but on opposite sides. Secord was captured at the battle and survived the war to return to Ontario. This is a monument to Secord in his home of Kincardine, on Ontario. He died in 1910. He was much loved by the local people. And now in 2018, an effort by an American immigrant to have the uh, monument removed was defeated. Here we have the uh, the composer of the Canadian National Anthem, O Canada, Calixa Lavallee. He moved to Rhode Island in 1857, not long before the war. He joined the 4th Rhode Island as a coronet player. He rose to lieutenant and was wounded at the Battle of Antietam in September 1862. Later in life, he promoted the idea of a union of the U.S. and Canada, which probably did not endear him to his fellow Canadians. And we're back to Edward P. Doherty, who was at, the, uh, at Bull Run, also known as Manassas. He is from Wickham, Quebec, and he led the unit that captured John Wilkes Booth. As a captain in the 16th New York Cavalry, Doherty was assigned to the defense of Washington, D.C., where he led a, the cavalry unit that captured John Wilkes Booth and David Harold. Assigned because he was reliable and discreet, he threatened to shoot a farmer who was harboring Booth and others. So much for being discreet, I think. He wanted, we wanted Booth alive, but Englishman Boston Corbett, who was a member of Doherty's unit, shot him believing he was about to fire, possibly at Doherty. Of Irish heritage, Doherty immigrated to New York City in 1860, just before the war. He joined the 71st New York Volunteers as a private that was captured at First Bull Run and made a daring escape. I don't have any details on the escape. I would like to. He was mustered up and then joined the Corcoran Legion, made up of mostly Irish immigrants, eventually joining the 16th New York Cavalry as a captain. Here we have Brigadier General Michael R. Morgan of Halifax, Nova Scotia, Chief of Commissariat under Ulysses S. Grant, who you see on the left. He was president of the surrender of Robert E. Lee at Appomattox and was brevetted to Brigadier General the same day. He was brevetted for merit, gallant and meritorious service, and he retired from the Army in 1891. Major General Martin Thomas McMahon of La Prairie, Quebec. Uh, his family moved to New York when he was very young. 
he was highly educated. He was raised, he raised a company of New York Cavalry and made uh, captain. He became aide de camp to General George McClellan in the Army of the Potomac. He was awarded the Medal of Honor in 1891 for actions at the Battle of White Oak Swamp in June of 1862 um, in Virginia. So he uh, could not have received the medal in 1891. Uh, while under fire, he destroyed a train for any from falling into the hands of the enemy. During the war, McMahon rose only to lieutenant colonel. He was brevetted to Brigadier General in 1866 by President Andrew Johnson to rank from March 13, 1865, which was during the war. Now, three days later, though, Johnson again, again brevetted him to Major General to rank also from March 13, 1865. The question is, why did that happen? We don't know. And here we're back to Major General uh, John McNeil, who was in our first slide. Descended from American loyalists, he moved to Boston, uh, then to Missouri. Pre-war, he was a member of the Missouri legislature and president of the Pacific Insurance Company. Although a Democrat with Southern associates, he joined the Union side, becoming a colonel of the 3rd Regiment U.S. Reserve Corps Infantry. McNeil commanded the Northeast District of Missouri. Brigadier General John M. Schofield ordered McNeil, quote, not to be too moderate in the measure of severity dealt to, end quote, Confederate guerrillas operating behind Union lines. In August of 1862, McNeil captured 47 Confederates. He, was shot 50, he shot 15 who were in violation of their parole. McNeil executed a Confederate officer who was not only a guerrilla, but was recruiting behind Union lines and duping for, former Confederate POWs into becoming guerrillas in violation of their paroles. However, he allowed that officer to give the command to fire at his own execution. The Camp Jackson massacre in St. Louis occurred in May 1861. Some of McNeil's troops, mostly Green German volunteers, fired on captured rebel militia, killing 28, mostly civilians. In September of 1862, McNeil occupied Palmyra, Missouri, where he executed 10 Confederate POWs in retaliation for the abduction and presumed murder of a Union loyalist an alleged informer. And for this, he received the sobriquet of the Butcher of Palmyra. He was criticized even by Northern sympathizers and excoriated by the American and European press. In his home province of Nova Scotia, the provincial Wesleyan newspaper called McNeil a monster of iniquity. However, he was supported by Harper's Weekly Magazine and the Palmyra Courier. He was promoted to Brigadier General, dating from November 1862, two months after the executions, so President Lincoln and the Senate couldn't have thought too badly of him. At the end of the war, he was brevetted to Major General for faithful and meritorious service. He had a distinguished military career and a successful post-war government career as a civilian. Getting to the U.S. Navy and the Canadians who served there. Uh, during the Battle of Mobile Bay, we had uh, these five Canadians, Benjamin Jackson, who was black in Nova Scotia, he, was, uh, he came in as a substitute and was on the USS Richmond. James McIntosh of the USS Richmond. William Pelham from Nova Scotia, USS Hartford. Thomas Pat Fitzpatrick, USS Hartford. And again, Louis Chappett, Canadian-born USS Lackawanna. During the Battle of Mobile Bay, August 5th, 1864, this is when Admiral Farragut famously said, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. Jackson from Nova Scotia threw a live hand grenade overboard. He would later lose an arm while trying to deactivate a mine. Fitzpatrick and Chappett continued fighting after being wounded. McIntosh and Pelham remained cool under fire and all but Jackson received the Medal of Honor. Now, was this racist? We don't know. Jackson was black, but I can tell you that 25 black soldiers and sailors were awarded the Medal of Honor during the Civil War. Some Canadians had second thoughts because it wasn't all milk and honey. A soldier's life was hard. There was the Trent Affair that cast a pall over Canadian participation in the war. Recruitment of underage boys caused uh, a lot of uh, problems and distress for their parents. Many Canadians deserted. And Lord Richard Lyons, Great, Britain, uh, Great Britain's ambassador to the USA, tried to get as many repatriated as he could. Lyons' job was made more difficult by unreliable enlistment records, delays in moving through diplomatic channels, and difficulty contacting regiments in the field. Most cases bogged down due to red tape or ended when it was learned the soldier in question couldn't be found, had died, or had deserted. In February of 1862, Congress enacted legislation that ended the practice of petitioning for release of underage soldiers. 
The Canadian Governor General informed Canadian parents whose children were in the U.S. Army that there was nothing to be done to get them out. One regiment had so many Canadian deserters that the commanding officer restricted all of them to camp. What did we know about Confederate Canadians? Very little. Poor record keeping in the South was compounded by the fact that the records were stored in Virginia and Richmond were lost when the city was burned in early April 1865. They believe 1,000 to 40,000, but there's no way to substantiate that. Most Canadians and Maritimes joined the Northern regiments in any event. So some of the notable Confederate Canadians we do know about, we already talked about uh, Dr. Solomon Secord. Lewis Mitchell Coxeter of Nova Scotia operated a privateer against Yankee shipping in a captured vessel renamed Jefferson Davis. When the Davis was sunk, Coxeter went to England to assume command of the blockade runner Herald, and later he commanded the General Beauregard. Dunbar, Charles Dunbar, served on the ironclad CSS Virginia, which was the Merrimack. He was killed when the Virginia attacked the CSS USS Cumberland in March 1862, one day before its encounter with the Monitor. William Robinson resigned from the U.S. Army in May 1861 and was commissioned as a lieutenant colonel in command of the 2nd North Carolina, Carolina Cavalry. Promoted to colonel in 1864, he was transferred to the Confederate Navy. George Ellsworth, a telegraph operator living in Texas, was originally staunchly pro-Union but changed his loyalties. Eventually, he joined the Confederate Cavalry Raider John Morgan. He earned the nickname Lightning Morgan in a commission as a captain because he was adept at intercepting northern telegraph messages and mimicking the style of federal telegraphers and sending out false information about Morgan's whereabouts. He was captured but escaped. He engaged in several failed espionage plots in the north. After the war, he tried unsuccessfully to rob a train in Texas. He resumed working as a telegraph operator and died in Louisiana in 1899, and there were many others. Now, we can't forget about the chaplains. Father Thomas Ulay was a uh, member of the so Society of Jesus. He was a Jesuit and was a chaplain for the Fighting 69th. Born in Quebec, Thomas Ulay studied in the diocesan priesthood in Montreal before joining the Jesuits. He was eventually sent to St. John's College in New York City, which is now Fordham University. At the outset of the war, Father Ulay accepted a military chaplaincy in the 69th New York Regiment a predominantly Irish American unit, ultimately known as the Fighting 69th, a sobriquet attributed to General Robert E. Lee. Described as a short, spare, active, lively man, Ole served in all, for all four years of the war through some of the roughest fighting. One historian writes of his army career, he did untold good and won for himself golden opinion from officers and men, Protestant and Catholic. During battle, he took his place on the firing line in the most exposed spot, to be nearer to those who fell and give them the promptest aid. Needless to say, such bravery won him respect and authority, an authority which was invaluable in the exercise of his ministry. He would brook no interference with his duties as a chaplain, and no one ever tried it a second time. After the Battle of Malvern Hill in 1862, Father Olay walked among the dead and dying, asking if anyone was Catholic and wanted absolution. A, mortal, a mortally wounded Confederate officer replied, no, but I would like to die in the faith of any man who is, has the courage to come and see me in a place like this. After the war, Father Olay worked in parishes in New York and Canada. In 1879, he began a 14-year ministry to Native Americans out west. Poor health brought him back to Montreal in 1893, and he died there the following year at age 75. Well, there's one group of Canadians that have been overlooked consistently. We won't let that happen here. And these are the horses that we bought and brought down to fight in the war. These were a separate breed, Canadian horse or a French Canadian horse. Um, the chaplain, the later historian of the first Rhode Island Cavalry stated the horses to be of superior constitution and medal for cavalry service. And many of them purchased in the autumn of 1861 survived all the hardships and battles of the war. They survived the war. Now, what about interest in present day? Uh, Canada in the American Civil War. Well, there are a number of Civil War roundtables in Greater Kingston, Ontario, Ottawa, Toronto, and the Southwestern Ontario Roundtable, which has uh, reenactors. And talking about reenactors, we have the American Civil War Historical Reenactment Society in Kitchener. We have the 116th Pennsylvania in London. Canadians come south and participate in the 20th Maine reenactors. That was Joshua Chamberlain's unit. 
There's the first South Carolina Volunteer Infantry Company K in London, Ontario. And in Montreal, we have the Blues and the Grays, 4th Vermont Company K and 27th Virginia Company M. And the last slide is a push from my book, Soldier Girl Blue, uh, available on Amazon.com and on, at my website, jjnights.com. Thank you very, very much for, for watching and listening to this presentation on Canadians who fought in the American Civil War.